Welcome to another edition of Telescope Man. Well, we're at the March 2013 meeting of the Texas Astronomical Society ATM SIG Group, Amateur Telescope Making. We're going to do a little mirror testing today. Smoke and mirrors <laughs> today here at the meeting. So right now they're clipping the mirror to the uh, little mirror stand so we can do a test on this particular mirror. This is a, a basic string telescope. Uh, this uh, design was invented by Dan Gray in Portland, Oregon. And the primary difference with this design is that instead of using trusses, it uses these bowstring uh, under tension to lock the upper cage in position. Uh, these bowstrings are non-expansion strings. They won't stretch. Okay, and so once once you get all of the what's called creep out of it, it stretches about three or four percent at first. Once you get all that creep out of it, it is no longer uh, will no longer expand, and you now have a fixed length cable uh, from top to bottom. If you have those fixed length cables under tension, you cr you create a truss essentially. Is you, you have the com the compression against these poles, the tension on the uh, tension on the strings creates a, a truss system which uh, locks this upper cage in position. Um, the two really important things on this truss system is that the, the pole that's under compression has to be attached to the same structure that the strings under tension are attached to. And secondly, the lower cage that the uh, pole is, the pole under compression is pressing against has to be completely rigid. If there's any flexibility in this cage, it doesn't work. So like originally I had these poles in the center of these uh, of this and there was enough flex just just in this 12 inch stretch of square tubing that that didn't work. That's why those poles had to be moved to the to the intersection where it has a, a solid backbone behind it. Uh, so that's the, that's the basic idea of the string telescope. Uh, I'm also using a wire spider, which was done by Mark Cohen at Obsidian Optics. Uh, the thing that I like about this particular spider, um, it's, it's of course very lightweight like any wire spider should be, uh, but because of, the, because of the way it's, uh, the wires are crossed here, it, um, it's able, it's able to hold the, uh, the secondary holder in space without, uh, without being subject to vibration. When this is properly set up, this thing will not vibrate at all. Uh, and these, uh, these, are, uh, these are high E string guitar strings. There's uh, stainless steel, I think they're a tenth of a millimeter. So the, the the entire the entire secondary structure here weighs just 11 ounces, including the glass. About 10 and three quarter ounces. Well, 10 and three quarter <laughs> ounces now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, what I did here was um, again going for lightweight. This the the whole idea of this scope was that it was going to be a airline portable. So this is all going to collapse down into a 22 inch base drum case. Because it's airline portable and the mirror is too big for carry-on, the mirror has to stay in here while it's in checked luggage. Uh, that's, a, that's a major challenge in that, of course, I have to hand this to an 800 pound gorilla uh, masking as a uh, uh, luggage carrier or uh, baggage handler. So what I did was I took a took an existing uh, 18 point cell that was built by Aurora Precision and essentially took it off of its back frame and built it into the into the uh, the lower cage itself and one of the things that I did 
in order to do that. Uh, you notice that there's there's uh, extra pieces welded onto the into onto the aluminum here, where the uh, where it uh, mounts in, and that was done for uh, so that I could insert uh, nut certs in here and have enough rigidity for the. Uh, for it to, uh, to work against. Uh, basically, the the uh, the weld, you know, the aluminum uh, square tubing was just a little bit too thin for that to to really anchor to properly. Uh, the nut cert would just pull right through it. Um, now, one of the things about welding aluminum frames like this is that aluminum tends to want to move a lot when it gets welded. So it has to be completely immobilized before you do any welding. Uh, in this case, what I did was I took a three-quarter inch, uh, three-quarter inch plywood piece, two, uh, two foot by two foot uh, plate, three-quarter inch plywood, and I mounted uh, brackets on that that I was able to, that I used to clamp these pieces to. Once all of these pieces were clamped to it, I marked the intersections where it's going to have to be welded and cut and used a four inch hole saw to open up those those uh, those knuckle joints. So that all of these pieces were clamped onto that onto that wood when it was welded. And so they were they all remained immobilized during the entire welding process until all of the welds were done and it was cooled off. That way it didn't twist or, or warp on me. Uh, if you don't do that, aluminum will twist in every possible way that it can. Um, Did you annul this in any way? No. Nope. I was reading the other day about an annealing process that doesn't use heat, it's just a vibration. Really? Yeah. And a lot of industry is going towards that where, you know, you vibrate this. I can see how that would work. Yeah. yeah. You just, you, you put these little, they're, they're held on, these were by magnets, but just put these little vibrators on the machine and let it vibrate for 24 hours. Oh. And you one, you don't have to send your things out to be annealed any longer. It doesn't require the oven. It doesn't require all of the fuel that takes that. And you actually are done quicker because you got a 24 hour turnaround. Right. Okay. Huh. And you use that for glass or metal? Yeah. This was metal that I was seeing on. Okay. I don't know if you can annealed for glass because I'm afraid it would uh, tend to uh, exacerbate flaws. That's, uh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of glass. So I just was reading about it uh, with metals. Yeah. Uh, of course, the uh, the biggest advantage of this is extremely lightweight. Yeah. It occurs to me that you might be able to line it still more if you depended less on this material here for structural rigidity. Yeah. Sure. Because as it is, when you got the poles here, when you got the tension on the strings here, all of this is subject to shear stress. Yep. And you wouldn't need this to be nearly as stiff as it is if you had a thin aluminum plate right here attached to all of this okay, well, well, I'm, I'm at, at intervals with welding. Yeah, because okay. the, the shear strength of a really oh, thin that's piece that's of aluminum, I'm talking about one millimeter, yep. it's tremendous. Yeah, here, yep. if, you, if you lock it into this, oh, yeah, I see it now. You know, for a, for a, a it. Addition of 5 or 10% okay. of the weight, you could probably get yeah. Yeah. three or four times as much rigidity yeah. in this mode. That's, that's mostly water, though. That's very it, possible. But then you would have it's a very solid possible. structure no. there, yeah. which now, might be good, might be bad. I, I will say that these were not my original uh, anchor points for the strings. Yeah. I originally had the anchor points right here. Yeah. And what I found there was a uh, because you always have some type of mechanical attachment for the strings. Yeah. When I went to collapse this down and take you know take the, the you know because this upper cage will fit into the lower cage for storage. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. So when you go to take this thing off. You put it down into the lower cage. What I found was that the the mechanical linkages here for attaching the strings uh -huh. would flop into the center and get caught. Yeah. yeah. And so it's one of the reasons I moved them down to here and redid re re my strings. So this way, all the mechanical uh, anchorage for the for the strings 
stays out of the way when you collapse the whole thing down. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, when I had when I had loose mechanical pieces up here, uh, they were constantly I was constantly fighting them, trying to get them out of the way so that I could get this down inside. And then reverse is true too. When I go to pull yeah. it out, I was getting caught on them. A little bit, it's spread out. And it looks like right in here is where it starts to spread out a little bit to me. Real light. Okay, let's try. If you can see anything with that. Yeah, let's try a bowl. You got it all Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Right now, Glenn is shining a laser on that mirror surface, and what he's looking for is the dot that appears on the surface. Not the one in the back, but the one on the surface. He's looking for any changes in that dot as he moves it across the surface, especially around the edge. And he, he believes he noticed it getting larger by the edge, which means that the mirror needs a little more work done to it, a little more grinding. You can see the pits in here. The pits are all pretty much the same. I don't see anything. No. Yes. First time we were there, we slept really in the Second time. That there's some yeah, remember, all he's, about he's looking at one oh. dot on the surface. The only not, problem not the big one that's mm -hmm. basically right at the, on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Uh, the one that's on the surface. Mm -hmm. so you, can you see the, see the, 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 the black mark? That's a sharpie. Yeah. Okay. And so what I did was I took sharpie and smeared all over on the mirror. And I got to thinking that the sharpie leaves a layer, right? So I took my glove. I was using nitrile gloves. I put a dot and smear it. And dot and smear it. I put all these little streaks all over it. And then, I, and then I ground it. I ground it until I ran out of energy. <laughs> that evening. You get the marks out. Yeah. I got all the marks out except for these are out around the edge. I went and this is what I'm seeing. Yeah. This is what I'm seeing. So you, you could actually, if you wanted to, you just move to the next one and polish it out a little extra on that time. So you think the nine micron uh, aluminum oxide will take care of this? Yeah, it could. It could it's so it's really my loop. It's pretty fine, isn't it? I think looking at the loop, the best I can tell that the leftover sharpie is on here and in the pits, mm -hmm. in the little teeny tiny micro pits. So I would do it a little bit more with the um, with the current grit. And try to get it out that way and then move on to the next. Okay. What we can do now is we can set it back up again and put the olive oil on it. Oh, yeah, see, you know, you can see the bit, the pit change. Yeah, in the edge. Yes, I was, I was looking at the edge over here. Mel was here. Yeah, you are real close. And work it this way. Yeah. And then and turn it just like I normally would. And it'll work the outside edge. Mm -hmm. Did but you make a full size tool? No, this? I did not. You found and that's that probably why you I've done the whole time like this. Didn't use one to take the edge on down. Right. Yeah. So uh, so tell me how you maintain your focal ratio as you're working with a with a, a, with a small tool or do that's you I've been or, or back and forth. Do, I've been do you use the mirror on top side? No, all the time? no, it's it's the yeah, tool on top the whole time. So I've i alternated between Tool off center, uh -huh. working it like this, and then turning it. And no, it. and tool in the middle. Well, you're, I mean, you're you're working it off side, right? But you, but you turn the mirror with the normal turn turning yeah. technique yeah. of uh -huh. walking around yeah. the corner or and turning the mirror and okay. turning the tool. Okay. But so doing you, this, you use this action, uh -huh. doing this action will take the outside edge down, uh -huh. and then doing this action brings the inside down. Mm -hmm. And that's what I what I really wanted to find out is, am I a parabola? Am I spherical? What am I? And at this point, we can't really tell. Well, it, it, it seems that, you know, that technique would work, but it doesn't sound like it would be perfect. 
does it, Tom? You know, it, that is perfect. Well, yeah. no, I mean, no. I mean, it, it seems like well, you'd be more likely. Be you know, the reason like why you'd be more likely to be off. The know, reason why I did this, this yeah. 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 is well, I wanted to learn how the guys do it on the big tool on the on the big mirrors. Yeah, a twenty inch. They normally don't use a twenty inch tool. No, they they no. don't. And no, so I'm I'm kind of doing a model does. here. <laughs> Swayze does really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he uses a 20 inch tool. He goes up to 24 inch. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. Full size tool. Oh, a full I, size tool. I I, 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 I would guess he has a website that we can read about how he does it, right? Does he have a I don't think he does. Well, he's got a website, but I don't. We could have to call him and ask him. Yeah. Okay. But does he post his number or can he give us his number so we can call him and ask him? I've got his number. I don't know. I think he posts it. Okay. Well, we can. We can say we found it. <laughs> so that was my philosophy behind this, was to try to model what they do on the big mirrors. got it, I think. The big mirrors. Yeah. I have never used a sub-diameter lens. Mm. Well, because I'm all a made three mirrors, uh -huh. but the 12 is half as big. Okay. And this was also a first for anybody that we know here, is that these tiles are glass. Yeah. These are not ceramic tiles. Yeah. These are the ones we built out. And hey, which ones oh, cut right. faster? I forgot. Let's go. Well, the ceramic uh, yeah, will good. last longer. They cut the same. They do cut the um, same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because you know, it's the grit that does the cutting. But the tool's going to wear out much, much quicker. Yeah. As a matter of fact, yes. As a matter of fact, this is the second layer. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this is the tool that we made here in November okay. with yeah. Ken. Yeah. 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 And this sure. is the second layer of tiles. If I can turn it around here, you can see. Mm -hmm. There's another layer right deep, underneath deep, there. Deep, oh, deep yeah. Deep. So I got it too thin. I got it down yeah, thin where I was uncomfortable. I was a long ways away from getting it, getting it down. Yeah. And so I thought, oh, I'll just go to Home Depot and get some more of the same tiles and put them down. Uh, I don't think he's in the But I also but I don't know. did a lot of the grinding <laughs> using a uh, ring tool. Once I cut these tiles Doesn't down halfway and it yeah. wasn't even yeah. close to where it needed to be, I went and got built myself a ring tool. It was. It was. It was actually, it was a, a four <laughs> flange. One of the six inch uh, four flange. Uh, more and, more and I screwed a nipple into it and <laughs> well, put a cap on top of that. So and it was. Yeah, it was. It definitely took it down twice as fast. Uh, who and saved my tool. And uh, then I was able to switch back and do what uh, uh, Glenn built an uh, observing uh, supplies box that he can carry out in the field with him. And here it is, built this by hand. Glenn, tell us about it. <laughs> so, what I did is it's all kind of groove. So, you can see it's got kind of in the groove in here. And, you know, just made a regular box with the face on it and slide in. But I made the drawers for the accessories, so I put in flashlights lights all in here. I have filters and cleaning material here. Two inch eyepieces. And you can see there's an insert that they fit into, into the drawer, so that the eyepieces don't move, wiggle around. They sit pretty secure. And the same thing with the quarter over here. They sit into a little bit of a groove, you know, a hole, which is pretty much the length of this this piece right here. From the base to here. So it sits in there solid and they do not wiggle around. So as you And I notice it's got a little work desk on it too. Yep, up here. Mm -hmm. Now, here's one little minor mistake. I, had a piece that chipped out and I just filled it in myself and stained it. But yeah, and then I put a map, a easy object with a list on the back. And you can use a grease pencil and mark them off if you're doing a Messier marathon. <laughs> You know, or you can just look at the map, and I'll sky map, and I'll probably put some red light, a red light up here that light up this whole area, and I'm thinking about some curtains, and maybe a rod that would swing up, you know, hold the curtain so you can put a, a laptop or something in there, and work on it and not disturb everybody else with the bright light, but it, it makes a nice little desk area, and you could transport it with the books in there. Very neat. They're all pretty tight little drawers, but I wanted them tight because I'm not planning on transferring it very far. 
But when I go up to a site where I'm going to spend the night, I can take it and just leave it there. And, um, if I go to a star party, a local one, I just pull out the accessories that I want in here and put them in another little box and take them.